Okay, so here's the here's the plan for the talk. Uh, yeah, so actually, before we start, if you have questions, I would like if you just stop me during my talk and and ask. And if there's like a smaller clarification, we can handle it straight away. And if it's a bigger discussion, we can leave it for Q and A. But you know, normally I would be seeing the audience and and seeing if you're following along. And since I'm not able to do that, I would like you to to tell me if something is if something requires more clarification, right? And the plan for the talk is basically to give you as much of the contents of the paper by Norbert and myself from last year, titled the same as the, uh, as the talk. Okay, so a little bit of background on, on free logics. And I just realized I have to move you a bit further to see one. Okay, so in the 60s, classical logic has been investigated with respect to existence assumptions. And what those are, oh, okay, yeah, the outcome of uh, this investigation has been a family of, of free logics, short for first order logic free of existence assumptions that have been under investigation. So what those are vary, but roughly the central claims of existence are the following. One, that the domain of interpretation is not empty. Two, that every name denotes exactly one object in the domain. Importantly, that there are no non-denoting names. And three, that quantifiers have existential imports that talk about things that exist. Then types of free logic are positive. They say that simple statements about terms that violate the uh, assumption too, namely containing names that do not denote, can nonetheless be true. Negative tell us that simple statements, atoms, about empty terms are all false. And the third, third type, a neutral free logic, takes that simple statement containing non-denoting terms take a third value, right? So we're gonna things, keep things bivalent here. So we're just gonna be dealing with the first two, namely positive and negative free logics. So of the existence assumptions, we'll primarily focus on this one, specifically that names uh, denote and see what happens when we move that. Although we will touch upon these just to illustrate the difference. And of the logics that take non-denoting names, we will deal with these two. So that, that says that they can still be true, namely at least self-identity is true even of the uh, non-denoting term. And one that just says, no, they're all false. Okay, so as a starting point, we take a paper by Norbert from Studia Logica from 2010. I will just tell you what the references are, but I need all the room I can get. So I just used the numerical references. So in which he develops a uh, secret calculus for negative free logic, which is shown to possess all the prerequisite structural properties, cuts elimination being the primary one, and as well as being complete for the standard semantics, well, a standard semantics for negative free logic. So, here, the starting point of this paper, and I'm actually, my presentation here will roughly follow also the, the order of discovery. So I'll also take you on a journey on how we came up with the whole thing. So the way we started writing the paper, the way we start here is we'll first internalize some of the axioms. Then we uh, revise the quantifier rules and we perform, uh, produce here a J3 style calculus. So that demonstrating this, that the system retains the structural properties is straightforward once the appropriate adjustments are made. I will be assuming that um, you have some fam familiarity with the uh, proof theory and then you understand how cut elimination works. I'm afraid not a lot will make sense otherwise, but also I'm afraid there is no time to get into that. So once we've done that, and that was the first thing we did when we started writing the paper, we then generalize. 
we first restrict the resulting system to produce a calculus for positive free logic. And then this really only requires us to omit one rule, strengthen another, both of which are geometric, so the structural properties are easily retained. And then well, we keep on generalizing. Next in line is the completeness proof. If we just go follow a standard presentation in, in proof theory. And for this, we need, we need some sort of semantics. So being proof theorists and not really prone to dealing with semantics more than strictly necessary, we proposed a generalized approach, which suffices for this. This is shown to be adequate. The systems are sound and complete with respect to it. Now we get a whole lot more out of it. We can account for the difference and the connection between positive and negative free logics, the relation to classical logic, all of their relation to their inclusive version, those that lack the assumption of a non empty domain. So, if you've been keeping track, that's the number one on the list of uh, existential assumptions. We can also say something about empty logic, and we can also extend it to model logic in a very straightforward way. Okay, that also tells us a bit about identity. Okay, so that's, that's the plan of what we'll do. To start, let's describe a positive free logic. Okay, let me just, okay, this, is, this slide is in the wrong place, but let's, let's do it either way. So axiomatically, I will be uh, coming back to this. We can describe positive free logic as follows. The really only interesting axioms here are, are three and four. These also are called one, two, five, six, or nothing special. Right. So this tells you that quantifiers hold for all things that are Ishriq. And these things tell you that they hold only for each week. So these two combined tell you that quantifiers here are limited to the predicate E shriek, which you might read as exists for shorthand, but doesn't have to be that. Okay, so this is basically positive free logic. You just limit quantifiers to this particular predicate. Negative free logic is roughly the same thing, except that where we had self-identity for any term. Here, it's only for those that are within the scope of quantifiers, namely e shrieks. And we also have to add another axiom that tells you that atoms are strict. If you have a true atom, then each and every one of its arguments is an existing term, or Ishriq term. So remember, we said the ne negative free logic tells you that everything with not denoting names mm -hmm. is false. So if it's true, it has only uh, denoting names. Okay, so this is what we are talking about in a bit out of sequence. Okay, so starting point of the whole investigation is the system N, which I assume stands for negative and not Norbert, although I'm not positive on that. Okay, so the initial sequence of the sequence calculus are four of four types. One is your usual shares the uh, atom on both sides. Then it's one tells you something about e shriek, and then this is a replacement for identity. And this one corresponds to axiom seven of negative free logic. Right. Which, I mean, if you know the presentation of, of sequence calculus, that's three too many. So let's see what we can do with that. This one is fine. This is what we want. The rest, they got to go. Okay, so this one, the replacement of identity just becomes rules uh, in a standard way following uh, Sara Negri and Jan von Plato's structural proof theory. Then if you look at two at, and four combined, they will tell us that Ishriq is really the same thing as self-identity. 
So now we know that however we treat four, we can also treat, we can treat them uniformly because they really are uh, concerning things that are equivalent. And well, this one will become a rule and cause and constant solve this one. Then we are down to proper one type of initial sequence. So it what is. the... Uh, so, sorry, so uh, we, we lack, of course, the, the T equals T as the reflexivity axiom for, for, uh, for um, uh, equality, right? Because we are in a negative case. So we don't have the uh, usual... We, we, we will have it, we will have it, but uh, we'll see. Yeah, okay, okay. Don't jump ahead. Okay, so what this one tells us is that, well, this is just a version of axiom seven of negative free logic. If you have an atom, then all of its arguments are niche weeks. This is atom, this is an atom. So turning this into a G3 rule in a standard way gives you a geometric rule of this form. Right? So red as an implication upward that retains all the at atoms from the con uh, conclusion of the rule. Okay, well, that's how we treat the um, shriek and then we said that we'll treat self-identity and and shriek the same way is there, is there a question mm, no okay okay so um i can only see like three of you so anybody else has to be heard but cannot be seen elio is one of the people i can see so yeah. Okay, so given that we are treating it the same way, well, we just have the rule that looks the same, just replacing a shriek for reflexivity. So this is a weaker version of the standard reflexivity of identity rule because it specifically requires that there is an atom containing the, uh, the term of the self-identity in the conclusion of the rule. But since they are equivalent, you can see that they're really treated the same way. Okay, well, so then we obtain G3 NF for negative three from the starting system N by replacing axiom two with a restricted rule for identity, replacing the axiom for replacement, for identity replacement with a rule for identity replacement, and um, then adding the rule E shriek for axiom four. Okay, so that's the uh, too many initial sequence. Now we also have to do something about the quantifier rules. So the previous universal quantifier rules, and this is like in that paper, but also el elsewhere, specifically also in the um, Benasevang uh, presentation of free logic in the handbook of philosophical logic. I might be wrong. So this is the, um, the look of the rule for left universal. This is right universal will star means freshness condition. And if you just observe these rules and specifically compare them to implication rules, you can see that they're precisely identical. Right? So you'll remember maybe axiom three for free logics, both positive and negative, really limits a um, quantification to an implication. And if you look structurally, it's reflected here. So you can see that you have regular quantification, but over an implication as opposed to any formula. This can be simplified. So left universal specifically, it, there's an implicit implication. Let that sounds bad. There's an implication happening in the background. Similarly for existential and a uh, conjunction, they work the same way. And in some, in some formulations, specifically, this is uh, Schwichtenberg and Hosta. These are actually just explicitly, but they, these actually explicitly, re, explicitly rely on implicit implication and implicit conjunction respectively. Okay, so we simplify both of the two sequence, or two premise rules. Uh, by noting the parallel between modal operators and free logic quantifiers, but working backwards, right? So normally we say, well, modal operators are quantifiers. 
but they are quantifiers of a restricted kind over accessible worlds, right? So working backwards, well, quantifiers in free logic are quantifiers of a restricted kind over E shrieks. And because we have this being an atom, we can simply treat it the way relational atoms are treated in a G3 uh, label calculus uh, for model logic. And what we, that's from Sara Negris and Japan Plato's proof analysis, and the rules then become as follows. So the right rule is the same, by the left, left rule retains the atom both top and bottom, and then instead of a two sequent rule, it becomes a sequent, uh, once a sequent rule, one premise rule, sorry. And um, yeah, same thing for the existential. So this makes them conceptually neater because this is not just regular quantification over implication over conjunction. It's in fact a restricted kind of uh, quantification. But more practically, it also simplifies meta theory and it simplifies proof search because well, you have less, less branching when you do a bottom up proof search. Okay, so the system for positive free logic is then obtained from this thing. And now I'm giving you an order of discovery. I'm gonna give you a order presentation soon from the one for negative by removing the each week rule because we don't require uh, only each weeks to do uh, um, atoms to be true only if they contain each week things. And then using the unmodified reflexivity rule because in positive free logic, everything is self-identical, regardless of where it's in terms of each week. Which is to say, we really just replace the quantified rules of G3C, which is a classical quantified G3 system from structural proof theory with the new quantifier rules. And in, in this case, G3NF is in turn produced from G3PF, by modifying the reflexivity rule, weakening the reflexivity rule, and adding the rule for a shriek. So, yeah, exclamation point missing there. So when we talk about the relationship between positive and negative free logic, it will be reflected in this. So we added one rule, but weakened another. Yeah. Add one rule, but yeah, we can another. Okay. So now we have we have the, the systems. This is how we came up with them. But if you want to just have the simplest presentation, you take G3C, you add the new quantifier rules to make it the positive free logic, and then you add the each week and week in the reflexivity of identity to get negative free logic. Okay. And they possess a whole range of desirable structural properties, namely just listed without proof, alpha conversion high preserving substitution, generalization of uh, initial sequence, high preserving admissibility of weakening, high preserving immutability of rules, high preserving admissibility of contraction, and big one, admissibility of cut. And this last one, as a consequence, has weak subformula property, and consequently, consistency. With appropriate adjustments, all of these can be established in a routine manner. The proofs do not significantly, significantly differ from those in structural proof theory and or those in proof analysis for the quantifier rules, because remember quantifier rules are just structurally the same thing as the modal operator rules and all the others are either geometric or standard. But because of course this is a proof theory talk, I cannot let you off the hook that easy. So there's an example of cut elimination. I'm not gonna do the whole thing, but I have to just show you how it works. Because also that's a chance to get some big chunky derivations on the, on the slides and I like those. Okay, so as an illustration, we take the case where the cut formula is principal in both premises of the cut and of the four, and so of the following four, right? So we have a left universal rule on the right and we have the right universal rule on the left and then following the standard procedure this is how we 
transform it. We take this sequence. We know that the right universal has a freshness condition, so the S does not occur anywhere else. And we just replace S with T because T is what we need. Once we have that, this side is good. On, the, on this side, we take this sequent and we take this sequent and we cut out the universal. This is what we're left with. Then we cut out the simpler instantiated formula. We are of course left with some trash and then height preserving contraction takes care of the rest. So the cut down here is on, on a formula of lesser weights. So eliminable by primary induction and cut two up here or just on a formula of the same, <coughs> sorry, same weight, but lower height. Because remember we took instead of this and this, we took this and this. So the height here is reduced by at least one. And um, therefore by secondary induction eliminable. Just to, to give you how the, the idea how it works, but this is this is routine. Of course, it's routine because all the work has been done in formulating the rules the correct way. Okay. So using these, we can show that our uh, systems are adequate formalizations, that axioms that were in the wrong place are derivable. So just to illustrate, we provide an example of A3, which is one of the axioms specific to free logic, and one of the axioms that is specific to negative free logic. And so this is the restricted in uh, specification axiom, just follows very easily. And this, of course, falls unsurprisingly. Notice that here we have a restricted uh, reflexivity of identity rule. Okay, so one application out of many of the structural rules is now that we can show that the rules of the system N, the one we started with, are admissible. These marked here and in presentation as daggers to distinguish the rules. So let's illustrate for the left universal rule. So we can derive left unit. The rule is admissible in uh, our new system. Likewise, our rules are admissible in the in the previous system. So this is the premise of our rule, and this is a simple initial sequence. And then you apply the previous to left universal rule, and from our premise, you get our conclusion. Yeah. It's very similar for, for existential, nothing, nothing special there. Therefore, the systems are deductive equivalent, some work to be done on the axioms, but that's uh, just tedious, not, not hard. So the systems are, are deductively. So the adequacy of axiomatizations, of course, homodisponence is admissible and independently, deductive equivalence pre with previous systems, both suffice to indirectly establish completeness of both of these systems to any, or some semantics for either. Of course, using sequent calculi, we can do better, so we, are not satisfied with just having an indirectly established completeness. Of course, to do this, we will need semantics. Or will we? Well, some of it, as little as possible. So in presenting the appropriate semantics for the completeness proof, we take our cue from structural proof theory and disregard how actually atomic sentences gain their value, their truth value. We just say, well, um, we're sure there is a way to, to get them to have some sort of truth value. In a nutshell, we take a picture of a model instead of a model. So the first step in assigning truth values, you sort of, you take a model and then you assign truth values to atom, which is something that your logic can deal with. And then you just assign truth values to all the others based on atoms. We really don't have to see what it is the picture of, as long as we assume that 
it is a picture. And we just take pictures of models and deal with those. I see. So first one of these is a negative structure. I'm just maybe move so I can see my titles. Yeah. Is a negative structure. So this will be a picture of a semantics for negative pre-logic. So this is a uh, pair of a uh, countable list of names and an interpretation function phi, which to each name assigns itself. To sort of stress how D has a uh, dual role here of being both a list of names and the things that we talk about. We will abuse the notation and say that the interpretation of D is itself. Then we take some of those for each week. Then for identity, we take a union closed under symmetry and transitivity of two sets. One is the reflexive set, which just takes pairs with themselves of the entire E shriek. And the other just takes pairs of E shrieks. And then for extensions of all the other predicates, we just take appropriate and tuples of objects from E shriek, making sure that in doing so, we uh, obey the assignment up here. So we first figure out, sort out the identity, and then we sort out everything else, making sure that identity is still respected. So whenever S occurs, then if S and T are identical, T will occur there as well. Okay, so that's the negative structure. So we pick out E shriek and then everything else you will notice happens within it. Now for a positive free structure, we broaden things up, broaden things a little. So the ref reflexive set is taken from the entirety of D. Uh, the rest of identity is as well. And so are the predicates. So now we can just take from D freely. We don't have to worry about E shriek. So we can just omit the clause for E shriek because it is just defined like any other unary predicate in this clause. So it doesn't have to come before everything else. So there's a difference in the negative structure with establishing all the extensions within E shriek and in positive structures, we're establishing all the extensions within D. Okay, and then the truth value assignment go as you would expect. So the atoms are true just in case they're and tuple for the extension occurs uh, and the end tuple occurs in the uh, extension. Then for uh, quantifiers, and notice that this is valuation for either a positive or a negative structure. Uh, because in either positive or negative free logic, quantifiers are limited to each shriek. They just function the same way. The difference is where you pick your predicates from. So these are standard limited to E shrieks. Yeah. We'll say the formula is valid on a structure if it's true on that structure and then valid simpliciter if it's valid on any structure. And that's really all we need. Just a picture semantics. Okay, so if a sequence is derivable in our G3 for positive respectively negative free logic, then it is uh, valid on a positive respectively negative structure. Of course, uh, sequence being valid on a structure just means whenever all the formulas in the antecedent of a sequence are valid, then some formula in the succedent likewise is. And uh, we prove this by induction on the height of the derivation of gamma and tails delta. 
we will just illustrate for the example of left universal. I think probably everything will be throughout the talk is illustrated for left universal or universal at least. So if the last step observation is obtained via it, then it has the following form. So assume that everything on the right, of oh, no, sorry, on the left is valid. We need to show that something on the right is. Well, then since the universal and E shriek are valid by our assignments, so is the instance. But then everything on the left up here is valid. And then by inductive hypothesis, so is something in delta. It's straightforward. Okay, now we move on to completeness. I'm roughly half my time. Yeah, okay, good. So completeness is done by extracting a counter model from a failed proof search. So we start this whole process by uh, building a reduction tree. So a reduction tree or a sequence is built in steps. At the beginning, the tree is nothing but the sequence we're after. And then we build a tree yeah, above it. So any sequence that does not contain the same atomic formula in both the antecedents and the consequence, that is to say, any sequence that is not an initial sequence, is called an active sequence. Then each subsequent step of the construction of reduction tree consists of stages, and each stage corresponds to one rule of the system. At the stage for, uh, for that rule, we apply to each active sequence, sequence active at the beginning of the stage, root first, thereby extending the tree upward, the rule of that stage. You can see how this is simplified by not having, well, having less branching rules. So for the right universal and left existential, the rules that have a freshness condition, we take for the reduction of each formula, each universal formula, respectively existential, uh, yeah, it's missing the uh, respective existential part, but the same. From the denumerable list of three individual variables, the first such variable not yet used in the reduction tree. And then if no other rule is applicable, we simply copy the same sequence over and over and over again. Of course, if the uh, sequence are active, we only apply rules to active sequence, we stop once we hit an initial sequence. Okay, so it's easy to see that if the construction of the tree terminates, then we have a proof of the end sequence. Namely, it ends with the desired end sequence, it follows, uh, upward follows the rules, and it ends only in initial sequence. So otherwise, we construct a refutation structure. So take an infinite branch where it didn't terminate of a reduction tree, starting with zeros, meaning the sequence itself, and then following one branch all the way up. Okay. Now consider set gamma star, which is a union of all the formulas occurring in any left, in, um, any left of a sequence, any antecedent of a sequence along the branch and take delta star to be a union of all the formulas occurring in any succeedent of any sequence on, in the branch. So a refutation structure for this sequence is then built by assigning true to all the atomic formulas in gamma star and false to all other atomic formulas, including all the formulas in delta star. Notice that there is no same formula in, in gamma and delta because they don't disappear and they would have uh, resulted in an initial sequence. And otherwise, once we have chosen how to assign values to our atoms, we just assign all others the same uh, as normal. So now you see why we only really need to assign our semantics to assign truth values to, to atoms. We don't go one step further than that. Okay, so 
first thing we need to show here on the example of uh, negative free logic uh, for the positive free logic is the same. So the re uh, rotation structure C for sequent in uh, G3 NF is a uh, structure, it's a negative structure. And this is easy to see, noting that the E shriek and the rules for identity are defined only for atoms and all the atoms occurring on the, on the left. Okay, I can move to this. Okay. Now we can show that any formula A occurring on the left in any sequence of the branch is assigned true by refutation structure C, and any formula B occurring anywhere in the succedent of any sequence along the branch is assigned false. We prove this by simultaneous induction on weights of A and B. So if A, meaning on the left, is a universal, then by the definition of, of a reduction tree, for every T, if there is E shriek in the on the left, and therefore true, then the inst instantiated instance is likewise, because we have applied the rule as many times as we can, and so by the inductive hypothesis one. So the universal is true. For every E shriek, the inst instance holds, so it's true. If conversely, B, meaning on the right, is a universal formula, then again, we have at some point applied the right universal rule. So there is some E shriek on the left, meaning true, such that the instance is on the right, meaning false. And so by definition, the universal is false. And this shows you that also in this uh, structure, everything in the end sequence on the left is true, but nothing on the right is. So if the sequence is valid in negative or positive free logic, then it is derivable respectively in the sequence calculus, because if it's not derivable, then it's not valid. And then we go by contraposition. Okay, so that's completeness. Just goes to show that the generalized semantics we had will, will do the trick. Okay, so now using negative and positive structures, we can define another structure one we called classical. A classical structure is a structure that is at the same time a positive structure and a negative structure. It's easy to show that in a sequent calculus that combines these two, which is to say a sequent calculus for um, which one is it negative free logic but with the strengthened uh, reflexivity of identity rule the following rule is admissible this just simply from using e shriek you can get to a sequence that does not require e shriek why well because you can remove e shriek because there is self identity but then because if we have strengthened self-identity rules, you can remove that as well. Consequently, Ishwick T is a theorem. Just take this derivation, but have gamma empty and delta just be Ishwick T. And therefore unrestricted specification holds. So you can just derive specification unrestricted, which is just classical logic. Basically, we have restricted quantification to E shrieks, but now E shriek itself is unrestricted, so quantification becomes unrestricted as well. Okay, on the other end of the spectrum is a situation where there's nothing in, in E shriek. In that case, we have inclusive logics, log logics that allow for an empty domain. Now, if we want to make either of our systems explicitly non-inclusive, 
we add the rule very similar to the NI plus rule, except that this one has a freshness condition. So instead of saying that everything is, is each week, what we are showing here or stating here is that something is each week. Okay, so let's take an overview of all the options we now have available. So we have inclusive negative free logic. The predicates are restricted to each week, and so is identity. We have positive free logic, in which case these things are just go all the way to D. Then we have classical inclusive thing, where each week just stretches to the whole of D. And then we have each of these again, but with an extra provision that each week is not empty. Right? So we have the non-inclusive versions. So graphically, this is the relation between these options. So this should not be read as inclusion, uh, rather uh, it's just schematic, right? So it's going bottom up you should read this as widening extensions of predicates. Right? So let's say like here, all the predicates are just up to each week. Here they extend all the way to D and here each week catches up. And then here, instead of being minimum of zero, they become minimum of one. So the bottom rises. Okay. and. Um, this thing here, classical non-inclusive structure, that is the classical logic. So what is this thing then? What is the other classical structure what we have here? Well, one candidate, and this is just sort of an aside, an informative aside, but not uh, crucial to anything going forward. One candidate for this, this slot in the systematization is the empty logic by Helperin. Well, so the domain is empty and the list of names is likewise empty. So consequently, all universals are just shorthand for true and all existentials are just shorthand for false. We could capture these by just treating universals as, as top and existential as bottom and it would still function the same way. But that's not really the main concern here. Let's just notice that Empty logic is clearly an inclusive logic. Obviously allows for an empty domain if it has the empty domain. But at the same time, it is free logic because, oh sorry, it is not free logic because well, all names vacuously refer. So this is informative in that it illustrates this distinction between inclusive logics and free logics. Right. This is an instance of a logic that is inclusive, but is not free. But as I said, in the, um, in the systematization, it is just an artifact. So we have a nice, nice rounded out picture. The other five points are of more interest. And specifically, we are primarily interested in the sequence of non-inclusive logics, free and otherwise. So there we have the negative free logic we've been dealing with, the positive free logic, and then the classical logic. Okay. Okay, I think we can go through model extension as well. Okay, so now we go to the model extension. Why? Well, unrestricted specification does not always hold in quantified model logic. So, Free logic, which is obtained precisely by restricting specification, seems to be a good fit. And uh, to obtain the modal version of these systems, we just go the labeled sequence calculus way and uh, add a countable set of labels, Ws, to our language. Well, actually, I think we use W, O, and V to distinguish them, to not have them just enumerated. Extend it with relational formulas, combine two labels, and then replace every formula of the form A with a labeled formula of the form WA. 
So we add labels to all of the formulas in our system. Uh, we also add relational formulas and we use labels to do both of those. So now the extension of these systems into a uh, labeled systems is more straightforward than standard. Standardly, to extend quantification rules into a labeled system, you need to have an extra bit of work done here. Namely, you need to have an A, B member of a domain of the world you are looking at. But due to the presence of a shriek, our extension for the quantified case is as simple as the extension in the propositional, in the propositional case. Namely, you just put the label in front, you're good. Of course, we should also add modal rules. And these are just standard labeled rules. They are structurally of the exact same kind as our quantified rules. And doing this, we obtained the G3K for positive and negative free logic. Mm. Yeah, from G3PF and G3NF, respectively. If we were to include the, the non-inclusive um, non rules, then we become the rule for non-emptiness of worlds from, from proof analysis. And then proof of the structural properties is routine because we have just added, added Structure, structurally identical set of rules to what we already had, identical to the ones we already had. Okay, so now we wanna give semantics to, to this. Now, ideally, I mean, simple, the simplest way would just be, well, take every world to be a positive or a negative structure. The problem you run in there is, well, what happens when they don't agree on the list of names? And you sort of like that serves towards neutral free logic. Since we, we are not dealing with it here, we will just have a global list of names. So then Kripke frame is the following. It's a triple consisting of a countable list of names that just is defined globally. Then each W is a countable multiset, and we want to have it a multiset because we want to uh, have worlds that agree on all non modal facts of negative, respectively positive interpretation functions. And we know, note the i'th member of W as WI, and then the, exist uh, the accessibility relation. Right. So then we have a list of interpretation functions. We have the list of names defined globally, and we have the accessibility relation. And then modal is a pair that they uh, assigns a frame uh, truth value assignment function such that it just acts normally for the non modal part relative to any particular interpretation function. And then for the quantifiers, it is defined over accessible interpretation functions in the same way as standard. So quantifiers within the world and model operators with accessible worlds, nothing other than new here. Okay, by really slightly modifying the previous proofs, we can show that the, uh, the new safe and calculi are uh, sound and complete with respect to their respective frames. So, and then focusing on the negative free model extension, another interesting result is the following. Even with invariant D, the list of names that doesn't change, Barkan formulas will, will fail. Now, usually when you have an unchanging list of names, you do wind up with, with Barkan formulas. Here, they will fail. If we want to obtain Barkan formulas, one way to go about it is to make identity itself invariant in a frame. So in addition to the list of names not changing, how identity works does not change either. And now we have the definition of an invariant Kripke frame 
which is really a lot of words for saying identity doesn't change. Okay, proof theoretically, we add the rule due to uh, Eugenio Randelli and Sara Negri that looks like this. It's called rig for rigidity because it really is very close to, to rigidity of names. So if you have identity in a world, then you have identity in any other world. Identity does not change. Of course, this is a geometric rule. So again, we have all the meta-theoretical uh, properties. We have all the structural properties. And now we get Barkham formulas. So really, rigidity of names gives you Barkham formulas. It's unusual. Here is an illustration of the derivation for the more involved version, which is the Barkham formula. And uh, well, you can see that we reuse the rigidity rule here, but you can also see that really what's doing the work is the connection between identity and Ishrik. Because we have the Ishrik rule, once we get identity, we can also get Ishrik. And um, yeah, so once we fix identity, what we really also fix is the extension of, of Ishrik. And that gives you a um, Barkham formula. So the kind of restriction you would normally put on a domain is now placed on Ishrik, and then you get Barkham formulas the center way, which really gives you a good reason to, to think of Ishrik as the domain, not the the list of names. This is negative logic, obviously. Okay, so I'm going to be wrapping up. I think I'm. Uh, I have a few minutes. Yeah. Okay. So the system we presented allows for streamlining of proof theory for various three logics. The rules are are simplified, which allows for a conceptually better founded quantifiers compared to previous approach, while also simplifying meta theory. The semantics we use to go along with it uh, show that meta theory allows for a systematic, um, allow for a systematic exploration of different systems of free logic in a uniform keyword manner. This extends to model logic. And likewise, the extension is, well, not a lot, but it is nonetheless more streamlined. And finally, what's well, something that's sort of left out of this talk, but it was in the background, it is compatible with multiple interpretations of free logic, specifically of the meaning of Ishrik. Now, like you can sort of think about it as existence, but nothing really changes if you think about it as the definedness or if you think about it as existence. And both of those, well, it works with both of those. Also, you don't really are not really committed to having the one domain, two domain, inner domain, outer domain on any other semantics. At the same time, you're also not required to do any of the metaphysical works work that goes with that. Okay, so that's sort of what's been done in this paper. Now, for future work, all I have to say it's going to be performed at a project free logics, variance, unification, and some implications with. Norbert Gratz of the principal investigator at MCMP for three years, starting probably September. And the uh, goals of that future work will be, well, to sort out what's happening with neutral free logic, which is the, the, the big thing that was left out of this talk. Then to take generalized semantics, which was sort of an artificial thing, out into the wild and see how we can paste it onto real world semantics for free logics of various kinds. And some, some other things with the general idea to just keep unifying things further. Okay, I think, uh, yeah, I will stop there, say thank you and stay safe.